All right. Well, that wrapped up uh, the end of the audio of Cheyenne Harris's interrogation. Uh, it was actually the same day the baby was found dead. I uh, spoke incorrectly before. We did hear the detective question her about what had happened yesterday, as in the day before the baby was discovered uh, dead. The judge right now just calling a short 15-minute break uh, in the case after that, but certainly some interesting, disturbing uh, information that came out in that uh, interview uh, back from 2017. I have a new guest joining me this half hour. Ann Bremner is a trial attorney. Uh, she's joining us live via Skype. And Ann, uh, I know just uh, before this, um, at the break, just before this segment, we were talking about how disturbing this case is. Everyone is really disturbed and upset about this to their core. Um, I have to ask you, you know, I know you're just joining us for the last part of this interrogation video, but we heard uh, Cheyenne Harris in this tape sort of feign ignorance. I mean, investigators and experts say this baby had not been changed in perhaps a week or longer, was sitting in this um, right. swing. You know, it, its clothes were crusted. There were maggots in the diaper. Uh, and, and she said, you know, I, I don't know. You know, I'm not sure when I last checked on him. I think he ate normally the day before, you know, saying that the boy's father, Zachary Cohen, suggested maybe it was SIDS. I mean, does anyone in their right mind, you know, sort of think that that could have been the case? How do you think that plays with jurors when she, she's, you know, really uh, quite ignorant there, feigning ignorance? Well, I mean, that's, she, she's lying, and she, she's ignorant, of course, and we know the facts don't back her up. I mean, the baby had maggots. I mean, the baby had been in the swing at least a week. And so to suggest since it's just outrageous. And a jury's not going to be sympathetic with her because we all know that the old saying, false is immunum, false is imperium, false in one, false in all. If you're lying about one thing, you're lying about everything. Yeah, I mean, I know you, you really only heard the end there, but there's also the fact, uh, you know, her affect in this interview. Towards the end, she is tearing up a little bit. I mean, uh, she she does cry at some parts. But earlier, I mean, she's really quite flat. She's describing the day-to-day. -day. At one point, she's describing how the baby needed special formula because of digestive issues, sensitive formula. She mixed the formulas. Uh, what can we read in, into that? You know, this is the day her four-month-old baby is found dead, and she's not solving through the interrogation. You know, she's... she's is just kind of matter of fact for the first almost hour of this interview. Yeah, I mean, it just it doesn't bode well for her. And she could say, or lawyers going to say, people react differently. Nobody's the same in a tragedy in terms of their reaction. But the fact of the matter is, I think we all expect from a mother who's lost a child, one of the worst things that anyone can ever go through, to show some emotion and and and, and to be absolutely you know torn apart. Yeah, uh, and I would think that that's what jurors uh, would be expecting as well. Uh, and we want to go back yeah. and play some of the earlier clips of this interrogation for those who may have joined us. As I said, this was a, almost a 90-minute interrogation tape that we heard. So let's revisit some of the beginning of what Cheyenne said in that interview. He walks back out. I start bawling, thinking I'm going to have this kid in this toilet. Mm -hmm. And he comes back in all calm and composed and starts filling up the bathtub with warm water and gets me in the bathtub. <laughs> yeah, and then I st all I could think of was, my I need mom, I need mom. She'd know what to do. Yeah. So I scream at him to call mom, and he gets mom on the phone. And she starts screaming at him to call the ambulance. And I'm like, an ambulance is going to help. It's going to be out by then. <laughs> had two heads before his body came out because there was a huge ball of water that came out that hurt more than his actual head did. Wow. And yeah, Zach walked out to call the ambulance and the ball of water came out while he was in there and the rest of him came out but before he came back in and he comes back in and he was just laying like he came out in the water and he was just eyes popped open and he was just staring at me. Threw towels on my chest and we wrapped him up and we waited for the ambulance. Yeah. Did the ambulance then cut the umbilical cord and stuff? Yeah. Oh, wow. Because that got to cut all of his but It was understandable why. Uh, the guy that we, that guy's house we were actually at, he had, uh, by the time the ambulance got there, he had clamps and was heating a pair of scissors. 
So that was the very beginning of the interview uh, when she talks about the day Sterling was born, how the labor came on rather quickly, how she ended up having him in the bathtub. And um, Ann Bremner, my uh, guest trial attorney, joining us via Skype, that was kind of what I was referring to when she's almost like upbeat, describing what happened as if, you know, you're telling anyone, oh, here's my birth story. But meanwhile, this child has been dead, you know, for less than uh, 24 hours, perhaps less than 12. You ever notice in these criminal cases where people have so much detail, they want to talk about all the detail about right. the baby's born, anything else, because they, they, they're trying to cover up. And that shows that, too. I think a jury, a reasonable jury, will look at that and say, huh, that sounds like lying, too. You know, she's trying to divert attention from the fact that her baby sat in that plane for at least seven days with maggots and everything else. And it's one of the most horrific cases I think any of us have ever covered. I mean, interestingly, that she has all these details about the baby's birth four months ago, but then when it comes down to the day of his death, you know, she's, right. she's not really sure, you know, what, what happened uh, that day. Um, and, and what do you make of the fact that the two-year-old daughter of the couple and all this, Nala, is found well taken care of in good health? Uh, and she talks a lot in this interrogation about the baby girl and how, uh, who was almost two years old and how she had issues right. sleeping and she helped the, the girl sleep. I mean, how, how do you sort of reconcile this? Here's one ch child left to die in this horrific, horrific manner, absolute extreme neglect and another who's okay yeah the psychologists and psychiatrists will tell you and i don't know if they can do that in this case that this can happen that there could be one child that's favored you know we've seen cases like this over and over again where there's a couple of healthy kids or one healthy kid and one that's absolutely just um terrorized and, and ultimately killed so she tried to say well one of mine survived you know one of mine's doing well and and so therefore i can't be guilty of this horrific crime it just doesn't it just doesn't work and and the fact is that it may well have been with, with this particular child, you know, she'll have her intoxication defense and everything else. She may have a completely different lifestyle with this baby than she had when she had the other one. But that doesn't make her innocent by any stretch. Yeah, you know, and, and interesting to note uh, that yesterday it was brought on the record that uh, the father of this baby, Zachary Cohen, was given a DNA test. It was proven that he is the father. So this is not a case where, you know, she got pregnant by someone else and this is why the father, you know, maybe hated this baby. Right. Or, you know, that's right. not the case. These are both the uh, biological parents here. So I just wanted to remind uh, our viewers of that. Uh, and stay with us. Viewers as well, we'll be right back after this quick break. So that's Cheyenne Harris describing the night before Sterling was found dead when her two-year-old Nala was having trouble sleeping. She had to move her to the couch. Uh, no mention, really, of Sterling at this uh, point, though, uh, when she talks kind of in detail about how she had to move her daughter around, et cetera. Uh, Ann Bremner, trial attorney, still with us via Skype. Uh, and I'm wondering, this is something we've been talking about a lot as this trial has gotten underway. We're hearing from Cheyenne Harris in her own words on this tape. Uh, what do you think about the chances of her also taking the stand? And if you were her attorney, would you advise her to do that or would you advise against it? I'd advise against it. I mean, nine times out of ten, I do with my clients. And when I was a prosecutor, I was always thrilled when someone put their client on the stand and just lessen my burden of proof. But it, with that having been said, with the intoxication defense, she may want to take the stand. I mean, because that's something she could explain. But the tape right now is bad. I, I, you know, if it was good, you could say, just rely on that. You know, like in the Michael Jackson case, there was the tape, a documentary about him, and he never testified because... He basically testified through that to the jury successfully. So this will be a tough one. You know, you mentioned the intoxication defense, and it's interesting because we're wondering, will that really, you know, hold up? In this uh, recording, she had admitted to doing, or, or in interviews with experts, she had admitted to doing meth about a week before. We know there had been, you know, certainly a history of drug use, but is, is that enough to explain behavior or lack of, of caretaking behavior in this case? No, because it wasn't acute at the time. And least, but she's also got postpartum depression mixed in that, right. you know. But it's not, sometimes, as you know, if you throw too much out there at the wall to see what sticks, it's not very successful with the jury because you're blaming everything else. You know, the fingers pointing away from yourself. You've got that means you've got three or four pointing back to yourself. Yeah. They were trying another thing. So I, I think that's a really difficult thing to do in this case. Yeah, yeah, and we know that they will be uh, sort of playing that. Uh, uh, postpartum depression angle hard and, and likely bringing on experts to testify about that. Uh, let's go back and listen to one more clip now while we wait for the trial to resume. 
and we'll just take our time going through this. So, sometime last night, before Zach gets home, Nala gets up, and she gets up. Where is she sleeping? Uh, she fell asleep on the couch while well, the futon in the living room, okay. watching the movie. So she fell asleep from the living room futon, at some point wakes up, which in turn wakes you up. Where are you? In the bed. In the bedroom. Okay. Oh no, she came in. I always leave the door cracked with um, the light in the closet on with one of the doors open so that way she can see. Okay. So now it comes in and wakes you up. And so you take her in, you bring her into your room and, and lay her down in your bed then? Yeah, I let her climb in the bed with me. Okay. And so she hops in with you, and then you soothe her enough, eventually she goes to sleep. No. No? No. Okay. It isn't that easy. What happens then? Um, her eyes were closed. She does this thing where her eyes are closed, but she'll still, like, pat around for you. And um, she tries, she does this, like, if she doesn't have a stuffed animal in bed next to her, she takes your arm, wraps it in the blanket, and cuddles that. Well, that wasn't comfortable enough, so she kept flopping around. She couldn't decide if she wanted me to lay on her arm or her to lay on my arm or to lay on the pillow. She didn't know if she wanted to lay on her stomach or across me. So finally, I got back up. I got her a sippy cup, and I tried laying her on the couch in the living room again. That didn't work. So I tried changing the movie. That didn't work. So I tried bringing her back into... Well, more details from Cheyenne Harris herself about how she kind of doted on her daughter the night before Sterling was found dead, helping her get to sleep. Uh, court should be resuming in just a few minutes. When it does, we will bring it to you live for now. I'm going to be signing off. Rachel Stockman will be taking over as your host, and Ann Bremner will be sticking around. So stay with us. We will be back in just a couple minutes, much more live out of Iowa, the Cheyenne Harris murder trial. Thanks for joining me this morning. the Law and Crime Trial Network. I'm your host for this afternoon, Rachel Stockman, and we will be taking you back inside that courtroom in Iowa to continue watching the Cheyenne Harris case. In just a few minutes, it looks like they're bringing the jurors back in and things should kick back up momentarily. In the meantime, for folks that don't know much about this case, let's take a look about what it's all about. A young Iowa mother faces first-degree murder and child endangerment charges in connection with the death of her four-month-old baby, Sterling Keene. Sterling was found dead and covered in maggots in his baby swing on August 30th, 2017. Authorities say the baby had not had a diaper change, bath, or been removed from the seat in over a week. The parents, Zachary Keene and Cheyenne Harris, are charged with baby Sterling's death. Authorities first responded to the home that morning after King called 911. He claimed the baby was fed at 9 a.m. that morning and was in good health. But when they checked on him just a few hours later, he had died. 
The medical examiner ultimately ruled the death as a homicide caused by failure to provide critical care. After an autopsy found maggots in various stages of development on the infant, the baby also had an extreme diaper rash and caused E. coli to enter into his bloodstream. Zachary Keene testified at his trial in November, which we showed here on the Law and Crime Network. He said that Harris was the primary caretaker of the child. Keene was ultimately found guilty after about an hour of jury deliberations and sentenced to life in prison. He is now seeking a new trial. If convicted, Harris also faces life in prison, the mandatory sentence for first-degree murder in Iowa. I'm Rachel Stockman for Law and Crime Network. All right, we are back live in court in that courtroom in Iowa. Detective is on the stand who did the interrogation of Cheyenne Harris when she was describing what happened leading up to the moments that police discovered that child, that four-month-old child in a swing left to die. Let's listen. Okay, we're hearing from the medical examiner who has just taken the stand in the Cheyenne Harris case. Uh, after hearing from the investigator who conducted the interview with Cheyenne Harris where she was describing allegedly taking care of this child and not really having a good explanation for how this child ended up in the state he was discovered in. Really quickly, Ann Bremer is still with us via Skype. Um, before we delve into the medical examiner's testimony, what did you make of the interrogation tape uh, and how she came off? I didn't think she came off well at all, and I think she had explanations that can be disproven. But that having been said, you know, in these kinds of cases, women are diagnosed, men demonized. Look at Andrew Gates, I mean, even Casey Anthony, people can believe she killed her daughter Kaylee or Susan Smith. So maybe you look at that tape and you say, you know, it is an intoxication again. She did have post depression. She is depressed. She was flat in her affect and explain away a lot of the problems, problematic areas of that interrogation. And, you know, uh, again, this is one of these situations where um, it, it's so brutal to hear some of the details. The medical oh. examiner is going to be delving into a lot of the details surrounding the death. We have to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll take you back live inside this courtroom in just minutes. Stay with us. All right, some tough stuff to listen to as the medical examiner details what he discovered on the body of Sterling Cohen after uh, police discovered him in that swing. Such a sad story. Ed Bremer uh, joins me via Skype again, criminal defense attorney. Obviously, and it's very hard to hear some of the details, especially now he's talking about the maggots that were discovered. But this is important stuff um, for the jurors to hear very important for him to hear in terms of timing of how long the child was there. Um, all of this is, I'm sure those jurors are beside themselves, and I'm sure all your viewers are too, in hearing this just horrific testimony about a little child and what would have been going through his head, you know, through all of this at that tender age, what you know, described as sewage here, maggots, right down of the skin, you know, blood the time that he was in that swing um, is just so compelling. And I don't know how the defense will get past that. Yeah, that's that's the difficulty with the case. Uh, we know the defense is going to move more uh, forward with this postpartum and intoxication that she was on a substance on drugs during all this and could not uh, could not have the necessary intent uh, to murder this child. However, it is very difficult, very difficult um, to, to get over the fact of how this poor child was treated. Okay, we have to take a quick break here on the Law and Crime Network. We'll be back in just a few minutes, take you back inside that Iowa courtroom. So many disturbing details coming out from the medical examiner as he describes what happened to little Sterling. And I think one of the hardest things to stomach for me is the fact that he detailed how that little boy really did suffer and that this was a slow death um, that went over a couple of days and how he would have been uh, crying to start and then really uh, become, you know, almost 
you couldn't even tell he was still alive. Um, I just want to bring in really quickly Ann Bremer. When you hear that testimony, does anything in particular stick out to you? Everything stands sticks out to me, like you just said. It's just horrific. And to think of that child going through this, and nobody did anything. I mean, he was basically ended up comatose and then dead. I, I practiced 35 years. I've never heard anything this bad. I mean, just with someone so vulnerable. And his so own mother young, and his couldn't father. take care of himself, and it's a right. parent's responsibility to do that. And these parents really, really, really failed them. Okay, let's take a quick break, and when we return, we'll take you back into this Iowa court. All right, it looks like the judge wants to take a lunch break before having the medical examiner go through what can only be very, very gruesome photos of that four-month-old child, Sterling. Um, so it looks like they usually take uh, a lunch for about an hour. I want to bring in Ann Bremer. She joins us via Skype, criminal defense attorney. We've been talking about how difficult it's been to listen to this testimony. Um, and they really want to drive home the fact that a lot of what happened to this child happened before the child was dead, like the issues right. with the diaper rash and the maggots. Why do you think that was an important point the prosecutor was trying to make? Because it, well, it happened over such a long period of time and was demonstrable, noticeable, obvious. Um, and we heard the prosecutor ask over and over about length of time, what could be noticed, etc. We know the ME said that we don't know what the child was thinking, of course, but we know on survival, you know, that there are all those instincts the baby has. They want, they're thirsty, they're hungry, they, you know, all of those things. And what really broke my heart in it on that testimony was that this child would go from, but like you said, fussy baby to basically just cold and quiet. And it, it's just horrific testimony. It certainly, certainly is. And the fact, and we talked about this earlier, that clearly this child had to have suffered um, all of those days without uh, anything to eat, sitting there in the swing, uh, not moving, literally his, his body oh. falling apart, um, and, and no one doing anything about it. Right, and then being eaten from the inside out and inside from inside outside, I mean, the fact is, is that with maggots, I mean, and you're dealing with, you know, the feces and like a sewer and the urine, and then nothing's coming in and the lack of salt, the lack of hydration, the lack of nourishment, you know, all the things that mom and dad need to give to this child. And they just saw it day after day after day after day and so on. Well, and, and w what we're going to have to see is, especially this, this case is winding down from the prosecution's case, and we're going to move into the defense's case. And something that does puzzle me is the fact that they did have another child, a little girl, who was, from all intents and purposes, from what we've been able to gather, she was properly cared for. Um, so what happened? Where was the breakdown that this other child uh, was neglected like this, and could this be some kind of symptom of a mental health issue or a postpartum issue like the defense is trying to claim? That's a great point. And the fact is, is that with timing, it maybe it was postpartum depression. She had the meth issue, although it wasn't acute at the time. She was not drugged at the time, but it was really part of the baby's death. Um, and the other, but the other thing the jury's going to learn is that the diminished capacity defense officiates the tent. So it's not like in Canada where she can go into a facility somewhere, but she would just walk out the door. Um, and that's a big deal in a case like this. But that could be the difference. But I said earlier on this, too, there's psychologists and psychiatrists who testified in these trials where one or two kids are fine and another one isn't. I mean, there could be preferred children, a preferred child. There could be one that they demonize. We don't know. But just because one is okay and another one dies in this horrific manner, I don't think it's going to be enough to convince the jury that, that they didn't or she wasn't involved in the death. And there, that you were just looking at was a shot from earlier of Cheyenne Harris. And we have seen her tear up at some points during this trial. And she looks very different now. She looks healthy compared to how she did look in her mug shots. We've got to take in a quick break here on the Law and Crime Network.
We're going to continue uh, covering this case out of Iowa when we return. Uh, a lot to break down, a lot to look into, so stay with us here on the Law and Crime Network. We'll be right back.